Bible says the goal of, of the skill of good communications is being able to live in an atmosphere of the righteousness of God. Listen, the other motives are kind of selfish, aren't they? Well, I just want harmony. I just want peace. They're good things, but they're kind of selfish. See, this takes that off the plate. It says the goal of good communication, the goal of being uh, swift to what? Slow to, and slow to anger. See, the goal of that is the communication skill of the righteousness of God. In other words, they doing the right thing at the right time based on a biblical principle of being able to access categorical Bible doctrine, pull it out of your soul or pull it out of the Bible and put it into there so that righteousness is able to conquer anything else that's moving on a, in a selfish way between two, two people or two groups. You with me? <laughs> I'm, tr- I'm, trying to, I'm trying to correct myself and saying, are you with me? And it... it I think I've become addicted. So I'm going to work on an addictive problem with that. In verse, 20, uh, verse 21, therefore, therefore, when, it, when you don't, when your communications doesn't manifest the righteousness of God because you don't pay attention to these three skills that are important and you allow to get yourself involved in mental attitude sins, Because anger is a mental attitude sin that can be manifested overtly or sin of tongue. Then he says, therefore, put aside all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness in humility. Receive the word implanted, which is able to deliver your soul. And so it, that, that's a whole that's a whole nother discussion about when you can't seem to conquer your tongue. You can't seem to have good ears to hear in them. And, and uh, be able to speak good words, you don't tear, you, listen, your words, the righteousness of God is not about tearing other people down. It's about building them up. And listen, there are two ways you can tear people down. You can do it verbally. You can do it physically. But, and, and, but listen, you can also do it mentally. You can withdraw. You can play this withdrawal game of isolation and separation. There are a lot of ways that this thus is manifested other than just in your face that you should be considered because when that is, occurs, you're not using good skills and you're missing the goal of what the good skills are supposed to produce. The good skill is supposed to produce the righteousness of God. What is that righteousness we're talking about? Here it is, 2 Corinthians 5.21. He who knew no sin became sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in Christ. You see that? The righteousness you want to give to other people is a gift. It's a gift. And the mechanics to being able to bring the righteousness of God into a hostile environment or people at odds with one another is be swift to hear, be slow to, and be slow to mental attitude sin. Let's have a word of prayer, and we'll we'll talk about how and what is our goal. What is the goal of good, good skilled communications in the Christian life among whoever we're, whoever's in our atmosphere, right? Doesn't matter if they're unbelievers or believers. What's the goal? The goal is the righteousness of God. Bring the righteousness of God to, it, to interact and to play in, the, the, in that hostile uh, environment, whether it's just mental or verbal or overt or whatever it is. What he wants out of this, what God wants out of this, is the manifestation of the righteousness of God, which everybody has because it's been, a, it's been gifted to you. It's you mentally bringing it into play. That's doing the right thing, doing the just thing, at the right time, in the right circumstances, based on what you've learned about the Word of God and bringing it to interact and play at the moment in a positive way. Could we not be a healthy church by doing that? Could we not have a healthy marriage, healthy family? Is that our goal? It is the goal of the skill of good Christian communication.
Let's pray. I give you a moment of silence as a believer priest and dwelt by the Holy Spirit, the privilege to confess sin if necessary. It is necessary because the Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. If you're carnal, how is, how you can't, that, that's in the flesh. You can't study. You're a Christian. You believe that Jesus died for your sins, buried, raised from the dead the third day. But you're carnal. You're carnal. What's the evidence of carnality? Personal sin. It could be mental attitude sins. It could be sins of the tongue or overt sins. But there's evidence in your life both by your conscience and by conviction of the Holy Spirit. So, what do I do? First John 1 John 1.9 says, confess your sin. He's faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you. That's the work of the blood of Christ working in the Christian life to restore you to the ministry of the Holy Spirit and fellowship with God. That's essential for Bible study. And so our Heavenly Father, we thank you today for these that have come our way by the automobile and by the internet. I pray, Father, they would understand the importance of the etiquette of Bible study spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. You can't study it and you can't apply it in the flesh. The evidence of, of in the flesh is carnality. The evidence of carnality is personal sin. It's got to be taken care of so the Holy Spirit can minister the truth. The, the, the spirit, Paul says the spirit is the spirit of freedom. The Holy Spirit will bring us into a place of freedom out of bondage, uh, out of reacting and, 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 and being the same old, same old with, the minute, with, with reflecting through our sin nature, the manifestation of personal sin and choices we make. And so, Father, help us today to understand some basic principles. The goal of good, the skills of good communications, as James lays out here, the goal is the righteousness of God to be interacted and played upon in, in times of hostility or or conflict for we've made our prayer in Jesus name amen <clears throat> well this week we're going to talk about this very goal again just to, let me do one thing in review uh, up there when it says be when it says be swift to hear be slow to speak and be slow to anger see that word be that that's a command that's the imperative mood so he's not suggesting this would be a good thing. You might want to do this. Let me encourage you to do this. Ah, he's gone beyond that. He's, he's laid down the gauntlet. This is a command. This is God's will. Do you understand that? And you know why it's in a command? Because it requires volition. That's why it's a command. You know what, you know what a command requires? Obedience. Please tell me you know that. It requires obedience. That, and, here, and here's how that works. Let me show you how it works. Be swift to hear. Be slow to speak. And be slow to get into mental attitude sins. See that? That's how this works. The command. See, that's a command. So when you're in that environment, come back to the command and apply the skills of good communications. And you'll learn today why the goal is to bring the righteousness of God into interaction and interplay with whoever is at odds with you. I, I'm just letting it sink a minute. Okay? Just letting it sink a minute. I got, I don't know, four points or something like that today. I'll get as many as I can get. I got four points. In our lesson text, James' goal is the righteousness of communication. The righteous communication. Bringing the righteous of God through communicating. Listen, we're, we're, we're people who talk a lot. Especially in the South. Ah. Holy catfish. Now, we speak faster in the north. But, boy, you guys talk a lot. That's a good, I'm not, I'm not pushing back. I'm just saying, um, everything, and, and listen, it's called communications. That's a good thing. Let's do it right. 
Let's do it right. We, we're talkers. I tell you the two things I learned when I came south. You talk a lot. You talk slow, but you talk a lot. And you hug a lot. <laughs> you hug a lot. Now, in the north, if somebody hung you, they can take you home. <laughs> They're taking you someplace. And so that was really tough. People come up and hug me, and I go, what's that mean? How do I interpret this? Because in the north you did, you just went, well, come on. So I've, I've, had, I've had to adjust, and so be kind to Yankees who come down here. <laughs> be kind to it. it takes us, we're slow learners on some of this stuff. Now I've, I've become a big hugger. Now they tell me, I, I finally learned to be a hugger, and now they tell me you can't hug anymore. <laughs> They'll put you in jail if you hug. I went, I, you know, I can't win. <laughs> so they, they teach me, and then they say, oh, you can't do it anymore. And I go like, how do I stop that? Because now I'm addicted to hugging. According to James, mental attitude sins such as anger hinders righteous communications. Very often, mental attitude sins become harsh and hurtful words, don't they? It's pretty hard to contain. Depends on the level of stress, Right? that's going on. Depends how much the level is and how much they've pushed your buttons, how well you can do it. Listen, the only way you, the only way you can be swift to hear and slow to speak and slow to mental attitude sense is the ministry of the Holy Spirit who shuts down the flesh. If you walk in the Spirit, you will not fulfill the desires of life. See, you don't believe that. I promise you don't believe that because you don't, you don't apply it. You can, listen, there are people in your family can push your butt and take you to the top floor so quick that it even surprised you. You got a little, you got a little sick going up so quick. If we really believe that and it began to exercise that, then that would eliminate a lot of our stuff. Walk, which is, by the way, a command in Galatians 5, 16, walk in the spirit. And here's the promise. You will not. You will not. I'm going to show it to you in a minute. It's a lot more than you will not. It's a lot bigger than that. And so, you know, righteous communication, is it a gift? Yes. Are, do you get it as salvation? Yes. How is it manifested? By the power of the Holy Spirit. You can't do this in the flesh. You can fight back. You slap me, I'll slug you twice. Where's that other cheek? Well, it ain't going to be given to you. What's that turn the cheek? Uh-uh. Uh-uh. I'm going to punch you right in the nose. So there, there, are good, there, there are good things about this because, it, listen, it's not about you. It's about bringing the righteousness of God to interplay in places where there's hostility, there's ill feelings. Stuff is going on that shouldn't be there. Everybody knows it, but they can't. nobody wants to control anything. Nobody wants to bring Christ into the mix. People will say, well, I will as soon as I get, get over being mad, but right now, I'll bring Christ in as soon as I get healthy. By then, they're filing papers for divorce. I mean, you got to be quicker on the draw with that. When he says, be, that's a command. It's a present active imperative, second person plural. Oh, no, no. Oh, no, you don't. Suck that back in. What you doing? Be so swift to hear, be slow to speak. I mean, time you get to the first two, you've conquered the last one, right? Because you're in the word of God that commands you to be, okay. That is a command for volition. Shut down your volition. You don't have a right to do that. I want the righteousness of God brought out into interplay of this conflict you're in. I want the righteousness of God to be brought out. Shut down where you're going with that. Let Christ in. Let him, let, him, let him be the mediator. Is he not the mediator? How many times in the Bible is he called the mediator? A lot. We just, we've been studying it in, uh, on Tuesday night out of, the, out of the book of Hebrews. He is the mediator. Let him be a mediator. Somebody has got to bring Christ in to be the mediator. Shut it down. Bring Christ in. Shut, shut down your own self-interest. Shut it down. Stop being in the flesh. 
walk in the spirit, you will what? Will not fulfill, will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. You will not. You know why? Because the Holy Spirit's powerful. You're going like, I don't want to be, I don't want to do this. You go to the Holy Spirit and he takes charge. He shuts the flesh down. He shuts it down because you gave him permission. And listen, that's a directive will of God, a command, and the imperative mood is the directive will of God. It's not optional. I'm not asking permission. I'm telling you, shut it down. Okay. And so James talks about that. The main issue being, being lost by mental attitude sin and verbal sense and overt sin is the righteousness of God. It's been set aside. Oh, no, I'll, I'll be my self-righteous. I'll be self-righteous in this conflict. I'll have my say. It'll be my way or the highway and all these other goofy stuff. That's, that's self-righteousness. At best, that's not best as far as God's concerned. He wants the righteousness of God brought into play. So I, I can't begin to tell you how important it is. It, Proverbs, in the book of Proverbs, there's an interesting word. You ought to pay attention to it. It's the word strife. And I just mentioned a few places that is mentioned in the book of Proverbs. In Proverbs 17, 14, it says the beginning now listen, the beginning of strife. There's always a beginning in it. Well, I'll tell you, I'm not going to put up with that anymore. He did this. I did. There's always a beginning. Shut it down. Don't let it, don't let it go into chapter 2. Shut it right down in the beginning. Shut it down right there. So we don't have three chapters on this conflict in our life. Listen to what he says. The beginning of strife is like letting water out. So abandon the quarrel before it breaks out. You know what it means? It means get control of the flow of water now so that it doesn't break the dam and flood the whole thing. That's what he's talking about. Little Dutch boy that I am. Stick your finger in the dike. Stop the flow of the water so you save, you save the city below the dam. In the beginning, in the beginning of strife, the beginning of strife is letting a little water out, and a little water is going to, is going to corrupt the dam, and the first thing you know, the, the strength of the water is going to blow the dam out, and the valley is going to be flooded. So where do, you, where do you address the strife? In the beginning. You got to catch it in the beginning. Water's a powerful thing, isn't it? A little, you get a little drip of water where it's not supposed to be, and the first thing you know, you got a little leak in the roof. The first thing you know, you got a roof. Uh, and wherever it fell, you ain't got that either. So, and, and there are other passages in there. James, the fourth chapter, one through three, pick up that word quarrel. Look, look what he says, the beginning of strife, quarrel. See where strife, quarrel. See, that's what's going on. That's the beginning of strife is all about quarreling. Qu quarreling. Quarreling. Do you know what the source of quarreling is? James 4, one through three. Tells you what it is. It tells you exactly what it is. What is the source of quarreling and fighting? He tells you what it is. It's self-interest of your flesh. You know what he's telling you to do? Shut it down. You know why? Because it's the beginning of strife. And what's strife going to do? It's like a little water coming out. First thing you know, it's going to blow the dam out. The dam is going to flood everybody in the valley. Shut it down. Who's got the power to do it? I do. How, how do you have the power? I got the Holy Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit of God indwells my life. I go to him. I say, I have, I have, I have a request based on Galatians 5.16. Walk in the Spirit. I will not fulfill the desires of flesh. I pull that passage before you, Father, and I claim it in Jesus' name, and I apply it by faith to my life. You'll be amazed how well things will go. Shut it down. 
Who's got the power to shut it down? You do. Not the other person. Don't give them that power. You have the power to shut it down on your side. You know, if the bridge goes out in the middle, two people on either side who are in conflict should shut the bridge down. Would you agree? They don't have to wait for consent from each side because the bridge is blown out in the middle. Somebody's got to shut the bridge down. And so on your half, you have to shut it down on your side. Whether or not you can get the other person to shut it down, I don't know. There'll be a disaster from side the bridge, right? It's, it's only common courtesy. It's only the right thing to do. It's righteousness. It's the right thing at the right time and the just thing at the just time for, for, for that. So what do you do? You shut the bridge down. How do I do that? I go to the power of the Holy Spirit that shuts down the flesh and puts me in a whole different ballgame that considers the other people's needs above my own. And I'll tell you, one person whose need trumps everybody is the Lord Jesus Christ. I put his needs before mine. How do you please God? Hebrews 11, chapter verse 11 says, by faith. Faith comes by hearing, hearing the word of God. I exercise that faith out in my life. That's how it pleases God. I don't know how you think you please God, but I just told you. When you bring the word of God into that powerful area of conflict, it's a whole different ballgame in your life. You can shut your end of the bridge down. Agreed? You can shut your side down, can you not? And how, listen, how important that is not only for you, but other people behind you that are backed up that want to go over. I want to try, but don't do it because, right? Here's point number two, righteous communication. You can always tell, here's the goal of righteous communication, building people up, never tearing them down. Now, sometimes you can verbally tear people down. Sometimes emotional, emotionally you can tear them down by the way you treat them. Stop it. It's no place in the Christian life. It destroys the righteous behavior. Shut it down. Shut it down. Listen to, listen to Ephesians 4.29. I'm going to show you something really important. Because this word unwholesome may not have the meaning in the English that it has in the Greek. Let no unwholesome words proceed from your mouth. That word in the Greek, the Greek language, this word's interesting because... This word you're not going to find, if you look up in a Greek dictionary and start with the English word, you're not going to find this word. You're not going to find it. This is the word sarpos, S-A-R-P-O-S. Let me tell you what that means. Scarpos is a word that means corrupt, bad, rotten, un and it refers to an unfit quality. An unfit quality. You know, you, 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 you go in a store, you buy an apple, you, you, you got all anticipation of a good, healthy apple in your mind. You just wanted the apple so bad, you take a bite in it, it and it's rotten. That's, just, that's that word. Unwholesome. It shouldn't be there. What should be there is what is designed to be. There should be skills of good communication, which is... Be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to mental attitude sin. Unwholesome is a word mean unfit quality for a situation. Let oh, no unwholesome what? Now what are we talking about? Apples? Pears? Oranges? No, we're talking about words. Words that are not healthy. Words that don't build people up. This is what the Christian life is about. It's about building people up with words, not just words of flattery, words of truth. 
Proverbs has a lot to say about that. Let no, let no unwholesome words proceed from your mouth, but only a word as is good for edification, meaning building people up. According to the need of the moment, watch this now. This is bringing righteous communication in. Watch this now. So that it will give what to the hearer? Give what to the hearer? Grace. Brings humility. Brings grace orientation. Brings grace orientation. Brings humility. Not my interest, but God's. It brings humility into the environment. That allows you to have righteous communications. Your goal, the goal of righteous communication is to building other people up and to give grace to the hearer. Did you notice that? Not unwholesome words that proceed from your mouth, but only such words as good for edification to build up according to the need of the moment so that it will give grace to the hearer. Romans 14, 19 says, so then we pursue. That's an interesting word too, isn't it? Pursue. That's not walk after somebody, would you agree? You're on a chase. Pursue is dead run. Not a slow walk. It's a dead run. Pursue the things which make Pursue the things which make for peace and the building up of one another. Can you do that in the flesh in the heat of the moment? Never. What can you do? Go to the Holy Spirit who dwells your life. You got Galatians 3 to 2. You got the Holy Spirit to point of salvation. You're in the new covenant period. You live in the new covenant. The Eucharist says this is a cup of the what? New covenant. We're a new covenant people. You have the indwelling third member of the Godhead living inside of us. Do you know how phenomenal that is? Nobody, nobody but nobody had this. Amen. I'll get Sam up here in a moment with his guitar, and we'll go on the road. Look. We pursue the things that bring peace. We are peacemakers. We bring peace in it. You can't do that in the flesh. Galatians 5, 22, 23. In 16, walk in the spirit, you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. In 22, the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, love, joy, peace, love, joy, peace. Supernaturally, the Holy Spirit produces it supernaturally. When you look to him, you need peace. Boom, there you got it. Instantaneous, supernaturally. Could you do it in the flesh? Mm -mm. Mm -mm. There'd have to be a lot of bargaining. <laughs> and that wouldn't be righteous. A lot of bargaining to get there. Mm -mm. Instantaneous. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, kindness, gentleness, right? All, all these good things. They're supernaturally produced by the Holy Spirit in you, not by the flesh. The, the, these things can be done by the flesh, but it doesn't have the same impact. Because the flesh says, I'm, I'm looking for something to get. The flesh is always on the move. I want something from this person. So I'll be kind. I'll be gentle. I'll be good. I'll be that. I want, I want, I want, I want, I want. That's the flesh. You know what the lust of the, you know what the, lust of the flesh means? Appetite. It has an insatiable appetite. The flesh, you can never give it enough. Well, I'm just going to eat. One little old piece of pie is my favorite. Oh, wait a minute. I think I have. Wait a minute. <laughs> I'll take that second piece now. My family, we were farmers. On Sunday was a big day. I guarantee you nobody left the table until we were ne nearly didn't have pants on. <laughs> we would undo the top button and then do the belt. And then grandma would go like maybe one more piece. Grandma would go like no more until the, you go out and do some work. Because she didn't want to see a bunch of men sitting around the table naked because the, their pants wouldn't fit. I mean, I'm just telling you the lust is insatiable. The more you feed it, the more it wants. 
That's called addiction. Mm -mm. Listen, we don't, we don't have to be victims to that. We have a flesh, but we don't have to be victims to it. We can be victors because in there, in opposition to our flesh, is the Holy Spirit of God, the third member of the Godhead. I don't know why I'm talking like somebody from the East, but all of a sudden, I, I was in New York or someplace. I do that every once in a while. I don't know where that comes from. The devil. Oh, yeah, could be. Could be. I don't know. Point three, building up others is, is achieved by the love of God. What is the primary motivation? It's always the love of other people. I want to bring the love of God. I want the righteousness of God to be part of my communications. I want the love of God. I want the love of God to be a motivating factor in my life. For God so loved the world. You know what that is? That is a love motivation, motivation factor. Where that all came from. Let's try to write that down on your paper one time. Well, anyhow, building up others is achieved by, by the love of God motivation. It's a primary. It, it, listen, it proceeds supernaturally. The love of God is a super. Listen, Romans 5.5, 5, I love this passage. The love of God is poured out within our, our, our hearts. The love of God is poured out within our hearts at the moment of salvation. Romans 5.5. 5. The fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5.22 is love, top, top, right on the top ladder, right? But it's the top around, right there, or maybe, I don't know, whatever, whatever makes you comfortable in the ladder. But it's the top one, love. There's, there's, seven, there's seven steps on this ladder. It's number one. The fruit of the Spirit is love. It was given to you by grace. It's to be given to others by grace. And or they starved for it. When that love of God was poured out into my soul, I didn't realize it. A couple of days later, I said to Jane, I don't know that I really got saved or not. <clears throat> Within two Janes, Janes knew something happened to my life. And so she said things like, Well, how are you know, how 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 are you? How are you doing? I went, I was already, she said, well, that's love. How are you doing? That's peace. How are you doing? Well, that's, that, that's freedom. How are you doing? And I would go like, well, eh, eh. See, well that's it. And she, she fed me all this information. Listen, that's how you know you're saved. Because the, the Holy Spirit of God in you is producing some of the things that he said he gave you by grace. And I went, huh. And she laid scripture on me. And I went, huh. Well, thank you, Jesus. I owe you anything for this? Oh, that that's been paid. <laughs> this is too good to be true. Never had to deal like that. They didn't offer me that, Michigan. <clears throat> but I probably wasn't open to it, to tell you the truth. <laughs> wasn't open to it. So building up one another supernaturally by walking by means of the indwelling Holy Spirit. Listen to me. Listen to me. Listen to me, people. This means loving without limits. Nah. Get honest with me. I got you right here, buddy. I got you. No, nah, I got you. Because, listen, we Christians, we want to love by limits. We set up boundaries and go, all kinds of stuff. Oh, I love you, but let me tell you, you're, there's, this is a two-way street we're talking about. Mm -mm. Not two-way street. God bless you, lived on a block where there was a two-way street that you could actually get. But listen, this is all one way. It flows from your heart to others. That, it's not dependent on whether it flows back. Come on now. Come on, church. We're about to have revival here in a moment. If for no other, if for no other person than me, me and the Lord, we're about to have a little revival here. Do you, know how, you understand how big that is? Because this is not the way the world loves you. It's always... I'll give you if you give me. That's flesh stuff. That's not the way God works. Listen, I'm talking about love without limits. Love without limits. Let me tell you what the theologians call that. They call it unconditional love. And what that means is loving without limits. 
Oh, yeah, but how often have I put up with that? <laughs> Love without limits. Well, how long do you expect me to do this, Ryan? Without limits? You, you're trying to put hours on it? Mm-mm. Trying to put days on it? Mm-mm. How about weeks? Mm-mm. How about years? Mm-mm. Mm-mm. Ha-ha, 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 ha-ha. Okay. Loving others. What God is talking about is loving others without limits. It means learning to live with others' imperfections. Oh, yeah, no, you don't want me to mess with you. Huh? Yeah, counseling. Yeah, but you don't know what they do. Okay, let's set them aside. How do you respond? Oh, mm, shouldn't do that. You do what? You draw his water? For him said, honey, I got your water drawn for you to take a bath. And you do what in the water? Oh, my goodness, you shouldn't do that. Do you know how bad Clorox is like? Come on, people. Loving without limits. Unconditional love of God means learning to live with others' imperfections. You need to read 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 8, because it talks about in, in, imperfections. It's going to tell you what they are. It's going to show you exactly what they are. Back several years ago, I mean several years ago, like 25, 30 years ago in this church, I preached a very similar sermon to that and dealt with married couples. I, I used illustrations. I used them right out of my life. I'm, I, know, I know more about me than I know about you, so I, I used me. The stuff Jane and I were going through, struggling to try to find, stop living in the flesh and learning, living, start, start learning in the Holy Spirit. When I got through, I, the guy come rushing up here, and I thought, oh, wow, I didn't give an invitation. And this man... Get him, Jesus. Oh, well, they said, I thought we was going to have a come to Jesus meeting. He reached out and grabbed me and pulled me off the, off the, off the, reached up and grabbed me and pulled me off from the stage down into there. People were exiting. Nobody paid attention. I guess they, everybody else thought he, maybe, I don't know what they thought. I tried not to think about them. Like, Get him, sick him, dog, or whatever. I don't know. <clears throat> and I'll tell you, I learned something about my life that day. It wasn't my life flashed before my eyes. I'll tell you, what did is my flesh. All that come to Jesus, he loves you, all that kind of business was gone. When he grabbed me and pulled me down, I went back to old Rod Edema, who grew up. If you grab me like that, I'll pound you to death. One of us is going to go home, and one of us isn't. And he grabbed me and pulled me down off there. All I could see was bloody murder. And thank God for Bill Dennis, who always sat up here or very close to me. He got to us as he was dragging me down the aisle. And I thought, when we hit that door, one of us is going to go to the hospital, and I don't care which one. I grew up fighting. I was a bad boy. And you didn't do that stuff with me. And I tell you, I was in the flesh. All I was thinking is how I'm going to, when he hits that door, how I'm going to get him. I'm going to put him in the worst place that he could possibly ever be. I could hear my uncles cheering me on. Go get him, Ron. Go get him. Go get him, Ron. And Bill Dennis stopped me. And I'll tell you, that was a, a come to Jesus meeting for Ron Adema. And thank God for Bill Dennis, who, who kept me as a pastor. Because that was a, a, a day I shan't forget. And it, I, I realized how quickly I could drop into the flesh. And I went, this is, this is not who I need to be. And I went home and I mourned over my 
my life in Christ. I'm warned. It was like somebody died in me. And, uh, and that was a good thing. I went home and mourned. What kind of a pastor am I? That I would allow this person. Drag me where you want to drag me. But give me a moment to tell you about Jesus Christ. That was the farthest thing from my mind. It should have been the closest thing. And it was quite a moment for me in the pastorate. Because Bill Dennis spared me to allow me to get back on my feet for Christ. We have to learn to love without limits. Other people shouldn't put them on us. The Lord should put those limits on us. Other people shouldn't be able to put limits on us. The love of God is a magnificent, powerful thing. And in 1 Corinthians 13, you want to read this because you're going to see some 15 things listed here. You need to separate. They're going to say, this is what love isn't. This is what love is. When I went home that day, and the Spirit of God would not let me have any peace until I read 1 Corinthians 13 and said, who are you in this picture? It was very obvious who I was. <laughs> it was pretty obvious who I was. And then he said to me, who should you be? And I said, I should be the guy that doesn't that is able to love unconditionally. I should be that guy. And he said, well, you have to walk in the spirit to do it. And I went, that was a, I was a whole new day in my life about walking in the spirit. I, I realized I walk in the spirit when it's convenient. And when it's not, I go to the flesh and the heartbeat. That's not the way to live the Christian life. That is not the way to live the Christian life. So I give you another verse. It may not be in your paper. You know, I'm not, when I say I want you to get out of flesh and go to the spirit, I'm not talking about biting your lip when it says be slow to speak. Now, if you have to bite your lip, but listen, there's a better way than biting your lip. You know, I hear people say, well, I just, I suck it up, bite my lip. And I know what they mean by that because I've been at, I've been that kid myself. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about go to the Holy Spirit where you can offer uh, a love and peace and, and all that kind of stuff. Listen to me. If you walk in the spirit, you will not, what? You will not fulfill the desires of the flesh. You will not fulfill the desires of the flesh. I, I want to close because I'm out of time. I want to show you something. Now, point number four, I got from Al. Al taught Tuesday night, Wednesday night, Wednesday night. He used a toolbox illustration. I really love that, Al. That was a great illustration to me. As an old boy with a toolbox. That was a great illustration. How you reach in there and you pull out. So I went into spirituality and point four. I want you to pay attention to that. But I want to show you something because I got to close. I want you to drop down. I'm, at, I'm on point four. You're going to have to study this on your own. One day I'll come back and talk about it. I want you to drop way down towards the end where it says there's a struggle. A spiritual advanced believer goes through regarding temptation to sin. All right, and I gave you, I, I did Galatians 5.16. I want to show you something. Are you with me on that one? It says command and promise. Do you see the command and the promise? Yes. Okay. Now watch it. Here's the command. I say walk. That's peripateo in every activity of your life. You know that now, don't you? When we say peripateo, we mean in every activity. You know, your life is like a pie and it's divided in all kinds of parts, right? And it means in every aspect, in every activity of your life, Walk, present active imperative, second person, by means of the Holy Spirit who indwells you. Now watch the promise. Oh, please watch the promise. Watch this. And you will not, see the word not? Carry out. You will not carry out the desires of the flesh. See the word not? Carry out. See the word not? It's a double negative. It's ukme. It's a double negative. That's a weird thing. The double negative gets all kinds of people, right? When you study double negatives, right? Double negatives are positive if it's exercised properly. This is a double, this is a double negative. It's an, we call it in the Greek language, we call it an emphatic neg negative, an emphatic one. Is, is the, the, how would that be? Here it would be, no, 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 no. You ever heard that one? You ever said that one? That's an emphatic negative. Now, you may go way past two, depending on who you're talking to. But listen to that. 
That's an ukme. It means, listen to me, it means never. Never, 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 say never. So I can quit. That means never. Now watch this. Here's the promise. Here's the promise with a command. Here's the command. Walk in the spirit, right? Walk by means of the spirit, which is command was volitional, right? And it's, you don't, listen, the reason is there, the command requires obedience. And, and listen, here's the promise. What? You, second person plural, if you, if you, if you, obey, the, if you obey the promise, the command, here's the promise, you will what? Yeah, stronger knot. This is this is two or three knots. Never. Is that absolute? Guy walks you to the door and he said, I'll call you. Next Friday we'll go out. And you think to your mind, if this slug gets me home. That ain't going to happen. You say, never. <laughs> never call me again. Never. Can't be one of these. Never. That's not this word. This is never. You will, Now watch. You will never carry out the desires, the flush. Listen, this is the lust appetite of the sin nature. You will never. But you got to do what? Never, but you got to do what? You got to walk by means of the Holy Spirit. You will never. Can you break? Listen, you can break any addictive behavior in your life. It starts with learning how to walk with the Spirit and then changing your mind thinking. But it begins right here. Supernatural control over your flesh. The Holy Spirit is the only power that you have accessible by grace to control the sin nature. Whoa. Let's have a word of prayer that we don't take the offering. Father, we're so thankful for all that you've provided for us in grace. I pray, I lift Alan before you today, Father. He would normally be one of the guys who would have taken up the offering. All things work together for good. Put that in his heart, Father. Put it in his heart. We preach this all the time. Put it in his heart. Put it in his heart. And may he have eyes to see the good. May he have the ministry in that hospital for the good. All these people that care for him. Get the flesh out, out of the way. Get all of the body aspect out of it and put it into the soul and the ministry of the Holy Spirit in the hospital with, along with his family. Lift him for you, Father, and pray for great healing and pray for his, his ministry to the hospital. Oh, my. May he, may he remember Chuck Farmer. May he remember Chuck Farmer's ministry out of the hospitals. Take this offering, Father. May we be good stewards with what people give us to our care to press the teaching of the word of God and the evangelism, not only in America, not only in our community, but throughout the world. In Jesus' name, amen.